Hey, good morning. Let's give the Lord a hand today. You know what? We need to give the Lord a bigger hand than that. Let's give him one more this morning. Yeah. Amen. We are the church and he is the Lord and that is why we are here to celebrate today the risen Jesus Christ. And uh, Jim, so good to see you. Jim's been back after a little bit away. We're so glad you're doing well and here with us today. What a blessing. Well, it is a blessing to have all of us together today and to be celebrating who Jesus Christ is and that he is alive and we get to follow him. And uh, we also are celebrating, because of who the Lord is, uh, the faithful ministry and incredible ministry of Debbie Keegan, our uh, preschool director. We give her a hand this morning. We're going to bring her on up here at the end of the service, and we also get to celebrate later this week with a worship night on Wednesday night. Hope you'll join us. It's going to be just a great time. You can bring your whole family. Uh, we will have some child care here as well, but we're just going to go deep with the Lord and uh, sing some hymns and some new songs and have some guided prayer time. It's going to be a special, special time. But I want to begin uh, with a bit of a history question for all of you. And so this is going to test your trivia skills, all right? We're going to see how good you are, uh, are out there because most people can name uh, at least one name of someone who was crucified by Rome in the first century. And the first name is pretty easy because it's Jesus, all right? So we, most of us know that, but there's another person that some people can sometimes remember who was also crucified by Rome in the first century, and he was a gladiator. I'll give you a hint. Uh, he also was a slave. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? You can yell it out. Spartacus. Spartacus. Who was that over there? Raise that hand. Very good. That was awesome. The spiritual people sit right over here, so... <laughs> It's good to have the spiritual people in the room. Yes, yeah, Spartacus, he was such an inspiring person in history that many, many people have written books about him and movies have been made about him. And he was somebody who led a slave rebellion against Rome in 70 AD. And he was so successful that Rome actually got scared. And they began to realize, well, if the slaves in our empire actually get motivated and get united together, we could be trouble if they rise up against us. And Rome finally conquered Spartacus and his followers, this slave rebellion. And to make sure that no one ever led another slave rebellion in Rome, they took Spartacus and they crucified him along with all of his soldiers on the highway leading into Rome itself. And there they left their bodies on those crosses for all to see, to rot. It was a very brutal act to remind everyone, this is what happens if you defy Rome. And then they paid their historians who were a little bit biased to research all of this so that no one would forget. And as a result, at least one person over here in the middle knows the name of Spartacus today, uh, as do some others. But this is the real mystery this morning. Why is it that we know the name and the story of Jesus Christ? I mean, think about it with me for a moment, because Rome's historians certainly didn't write about Jesus, and Jewish historians didn't really write about him either. In fact, no one of prominence wrote about Jesus at first, and he was a simple Jewish carpenter who was crucified by Rome in the first century, who was living in the armpit of the Roman Empire at the time. And yet we have four accounts of his life called the Gospels. In fact, we know more about Jesus today than we do any of the Roman emperors, which is rather fascinating. The question is, how do we know so much about Jesus? And part of the answer to that can be found in the book of Acts, where we're going to take a look today in Acts chapter 11, how this relatively small group of people were witnesses who said, we were with him, we knew Jesus, and we walked with him and listened to him, and we were there about 100 yards over there when they crucified him on that cross. And we were there over there about 200 yards from here when he rose from the dead and we saw him alive. 
And we saw him ascend to heaven. And there was this movement of people, basically, that began to live. And they were God-empowered, spirit-driven movement. And they're like, this didn't happen 50 years ago. This happened two months ago in Jerusalem. And they lived with this clear mission that changed the world so much so that you and I are here worshiping the Lord today. And let's remind ourselves what the early church was like because it's easy to forget because when the church was first birthed on Pentecost Sunday, by the way, which is today when the Holy Spirit was given to the church, we celebrate that on this day in the calendar year. Uh, But on the opening week of the church, it was not a small movement. By the end of the week, it was 8,000 plus people had given their life to Jesus Christ as their Savior. And there weren't any buildings, there wasn't a baptismal, there weren't banners out there on the street letting know the church was there. It was a movement of people who were disorganized, they were random, they were rookies in the faith, no rock stars among them, who were responding to the life of the living Christ. And as a result, this persecution rose up against them, and the leaders of the community took the main leaders of the Christian movement, all 12 of the apostles, the 11 original ones, plus one they added on after Judas was gone, and they had them whipped. And even though they had them whipped, the apostles left that experience and continued to proclaim the risen Jesus Christ and hope in him. And you would have thought they would have done a few things at that moment. I'm sure there were some people encouraging the apostles to tone down the resurrection rhetoric and don't mention that Jesus name. I'm sure others were telling them, you probably need to go into hiding uh, because we can't afford to lose you. They were probably even recommending, asking for them to have some security and to have some blessings. Black Escalade chariots following the apostles around with people in black suits and little microphones in their ears saying, breaker, breaker, the apostles are in the building and, you know, protecting them. But they didn't do any of that. Instead, they prayed boldly and they lived boldly and they considered it a joy to suffer for the glory of the name of the risen Christ. And pretty soon, people from many different nations started to come in to know Jesus as Savior. People like Cornelius, who was a commander in the Roman army. And pretty soon after that, people like Saul, who was a great persecutor of the church, came to faith in the Lord as well. And as a result, there rose up this great, great persecution. And life got so hard for the early church, they needed to be reminded of the unshakable foundation of their faith, just as I believe God wants to remind all of us today, or maybe even introduce us to the unshakable foundation that we can have through Jesus Christ. And so would you stand with me? We're going to read the beginning of our passage this morning, and then we're going to pray and ask God to speak to us uh, through his living word. We always put the scriptures on the screen. There are also Bibles in the seat backs in front of you online. You'll find some study questions if you want to talk about the message as a family or a group of friends uh, during the week. But we're in Acts chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 19, where we read this from the Lord's living word today. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Would you be so bold as we pray right now to ask Jesus to strengthen the foundation of your faith today? Let's pray together. Just take a moment and invite God to strengthen the foundation of your faith today. Father God, I thank you for every person in this room, Lord, and we thank you that we get to celebrate you, celebrate the risen Savior today. Lord, we ask you to speak to us boldly through your living word. We ask you to strengthen us through your Holy Spirit and through your truth and through your presence. 
Lord, we pray for salvation in this room today. We pray for growth in this room today by your power and for your glory. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, The passage that we're in today, we sped through last Sunday, and I would consider last Sunday as a little bit of the preview for the main event today, uh, where we're going to be looking at in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, where we read this, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. And so the church in Jerusalem is scattering. And the reason that it's scattering is because this persecution that arose, the Bible says, over this man by the name of Stephen. And what we know about Stephen was that he loved the Lord. He just loved the Lord. And he was a servant. He was known for being filled with the Holy Spirit And he had this ministry that he led for the church in Jerusalem that took care of many of the widows in Jerusalem who were in material need. And since he wasn't one of the main leaders, one of the apostles, some of the community leaders thought they could take advantage of that. And they had him arrested. They spread false lies about him. And they brought false charges against him. And at the end of all that, Stephen gives his defense Uh, to this group of people that had falsely arrested him. And it's one of the longest messages we find in the Bible that's recorded in the Bible. It's very powerful. And he begins to walk from the Old Testament, talking about some of the prophecies of the coming Savior to show how Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the Old Testament and how he is the living Savior and Lord that we all need. And this is what I want you to see. If the message is wrong... Nothing is right in a church, no matter how much is right. I'm going to say that again. If the message is wrong, nothing is right in a church, no matter how much else is right. And this is what I mean by that. You could have the best looking pastor up here right now, who is buff and hip and gels his hair just perfectly like a golden blonde gel spread over here. Uh, You don't have that, but you could have that, and it really wouldn't matter if the word wasn't being preached about Jesus Christ. You, we could have the best facilities in the world, and you have to know this about me. I was a part of a church plant in Hawaii with no facilities, and so any facility to me is like heaven. It's like wonderful. It's these tools we get to use for the Lord. But you can have the best facilities, but if you're not preaching the word about knowing Jesus Christ, you don't have anything. It's the same with our life. We can have a lot going on right in our life, but if we don't have him at the center of our life, we can be missing the most important thing because an unshakable foundation is found by keeping Christ at the center of it all, especially the main message of our church life and the main message of our own lives. Look at verse 19 again, because look at what the Bible says. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, and so when Stephen preached, and I never recommend this happening at one of my messages, but people were so upset at what he was saying that they, about Jesus being the Savior that they dragged him outside the city, they picked up rocks, they threw him at him, and they killed him. He becomes the first martyr of the first century church. And since there's really no negative response from Rome, uh, everybody starts rising up against Christianity. And this great, great, massive persecution begins, which causes the church in Jerusalem to scatter. And they mention some of the places like Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch are mentioned. And Antioch at the time is one of the largest cities in the entire Roman Empire. And so this is often how God works, where there's something really difficult going on in the world, something really difficult going on in our life, and God is powerful enough and loving enough to bring good even in some of the most difficult and darkest situations because of who he is. And notice what's clear about their message in verse 19. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, look at it up there on the screen with me, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking, and what does the Bible say they were speaking? 
the word. They're speaking the scriptures and explaining how the Bible is all about Jesus and who he is as the Messiah, as our Savior and the Lord. And it's, it's just like what Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 5, 39. You search the scriptures because you think that, it, that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Meaning that if you teach the Bible, but we don't talk about our need for salvation through Christ because of our own brokenness and sin, then if we don't do that, we're missing the whole point of the Bible. And the message of the Bible is Jesus Christ is our Savior. So we don't teach the Bible on Sunday mornings or in small groups or anywhere else just as a, a matter in itself. We do so to tell others and ourselves about who Jesus Christ is and what a relationship with him is all about, making him the foundation of our faith by keeping him at the center of it all. Uh, it's, it's exactly what Jesus meant when he said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that's exactly what the Lord wants for everyone in this room today is an abundant life, a great fruitful life in him. It's why later in Acts, the Bible tells us how in Acts chapter 17 verse 2, Paul says he, he reasoned with them from the Bible or the scriptures, explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. And what that tells us is that Jesus is the centerpiece of the Bible. The Bible is the entire story of salvation through Jesus Christ because an unshakable foundation is also found by keeping, by keeping Christ at the center of our words. And there's this move that happens in a Christ follower's life when we follow the Lord, and we see it starting in verse 20 where it says, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, and we'll get back to them in a moment, preaching, what does it say? Preaching what? Yeah, the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Uh, I want you to notice this, and I love this about the Bible. Luke, who's writing Acts, led by the Holy Spirit, he's always giving credit to God. He's even speaking to the grace of God at work in the lives of others. He doesn't say how talented the church is. He doesn't say how great the youth ministry was in Antioch. It was probably wonderful. But he says, and the hand of the Lord was with him. He, God gets all the credit. God gets all the glory. And again, notice what they're preaching about. They're preaching about Jesus Christ. Now, it talks about how they were talking at this church to some people, a group of people known as the Hellenists. And anytime I talk about the Hellenists from the Bible, I always like to remind everybody, I've always thought that's the perfect name for a Christian biker club, all right? Like, I, I'm want, waiting for the day when I'm driving on the freeway, I see someone on a Harley, they have a black vest on on the back, it says Hellenists on the back. I, I'm waiting, someone's going to do it someday, but I'm waiting for it. But basically, it was a group of people that didn't know anything about the Bible, didn't know anything about Jesus. And they begin to explain to them how, you know, how they're more broken and more sinful than they'd ever dare believe before the holy God of heaven. And that we'll spend an eternity away from him without the good news that we're more loved and more accepted than we could ever dare hope because Jesus Christ came to this earth and died on the cross for our sin and brokenness and was buried and rose again, conquering sin and death. And now he invites us to invite him into our life as our savior. And he becomes the centerpiece of our life as we follow him. And verse 22 says this, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. They're like, wow, this is back in the Jerusalem church. Have you heard what God is doing in the church in Antioch? And so they send Barnabas, this guy who's mentioned a lot in the book of Acts, to the Antioch church to encourage them. And some things that you need to know about Barnabas from the book of Acts is, first of all, he's probably, most likely, the one in Acts chapter 1 who actually gets passed over to take Judas's spot as one of the apostles. 
But yet he continues serving the church even though he doesn't get the high role in, in the church at that time. And then he shows up again in Acts chapter 4 and he's the one who sells some of his own property to meet the needs and the lives of others who are really in some financial need. And then he shows up again in Acts chapter 9 when Saul, who's been persecuting the church, comes to know the Lord and no one would embrace him but Barnabas embraces the grace that's at work in Saul's life. He shows up now in Acts chapter 11 to encourage the church in Antioch. And then he's going to show up again in Acts chapter 15 when he gives John Mark, after a season of failure, another chance because of the grace of God. And so in verse 23 we read, And when Barnabas came, that's to Antioch, he saw the grace of God. So he's given God all the credit, his grace and power. He was glad, he's celebrating, and he exhorted them to all remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Now, this is really interesting. Barnabas has this group of people in the Antioch church. They don't know much about God. They're brand new in their walk with Jesus Christ. And what's the first message that he's going to share with them as he's there to encourage them. It says he exhorted them or encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Now, one of the things I want you to know is that is one of the most common messages of the Bible, to remain steadfast, to continue in the grace of God, to continue in the power of God. To not become stagnant, to take faith steps, to keep them at the center of our life. And it begs us to ask the question this morning, is Christ at the center of our life this morning? And if not, what would be a faith step we could take to bring him back to the center of our life? Maybe for some in this room today... Uh, that faith step would simply be coming back to church next Sunday because it was a big step for you to come here today. And we're so thankful if God brought you for the first time today. Uh, maybe for others in the room, it, it might be that your faith step is to get back into the Word of God on a regular basis. Or maybe it's to get into one of our groups that we have this summer where we're going to just have some dinner groups that meet so that some great Christ-filled friendships can be built in our church family. And think about this for a moment. Here comes Barnabas with the first message for the church in Antioch. He says, you got to keep going in the faith. Stay steadfast in the grace of God. And so why do you think the Bible is always telling us to continue in our faith? Well, I'll tell you why. Because life in this broken world is hard sometimes. It is hard. And there are all kinds of things that the world is always throwing at us to get us off the path of keeping Jesus in the center of it all for us. In the center of our life, in the center of our words, and to continue with Him. There's all kinds of things. And, and following Christ is always good, but I'll tell you this, it is not always easy. Nor is it always convenient. Sometimes it even asks, God asks us for sacrifice. But it is always worth it and always good. And there's all kinds of headwinds that try to knock us off the road of being steadfast and just staying in the beauty of the grace of God. It reminds me of when I was trying to stay on the road once on my way to Lake Tahoe. My son Josh and I, uh, we, it was about three years ago, we were living just outside of the Bay Area in Northern California. And our church at the time had a Thursday night worship service, just like Sunday, but on Thursday. And we decided to go to Lake Tahoe right after church service that night and then come back late Saturday night so we could get back in time for church on Sunday. It was a father-son, quick adventure to Lake Tahoe. And it just so happened on that Thursday evening that when it finally came around, we knew it was about a three-hour drive, but it was one of those weird weather events in the Bay Area. Uh, there was a tornado warning, which never happens. There was heavy wind. There's threat of heavy rains, but we got on the internet, you know, checked out the road. It all looked good. Things were moving. We had snow tires and four-wheel drive. We weren't really worried about it. Driven in snow many times. We finished worshiping and got in the car together. We're driving up. We were about an hour and a half on this three-hour journey to where we were staying in Lake Tahoe. And all of a sudden, our, G our little, uh, you know, GPS thing in the, in the car, all of a sudden, our map, Google Maps, instead of saying an hour and a half to destination, it jumped 
and it all of a sudden said three and a half hours. It jumped two hours in a second. And I looked at it and I thought, that cannot be correct. There's no way that's right. Now, oh, we'll keep going. We were ready to get there. We got a little bit higher in elevation and then it started. It was the biggest snowstorm I've ever been in my life. And they were getting higher, and the snow's coming down harder, and the wind is blowing. And pretty soon, I'm looking around on the highway, and I realize nobody's coming down the mountain anymore. No one's behind us. No one's in front of us. This is not good. And it's getting harder and harder to stay on the road. And you know how you like you grip even harder on the steering wheel, and you get closer to the windshield, hoping you can see the road better. But I don't know why we do that. It doesn't help at all. And all the meanwhile, I look over at my teenage son Josh. He's sitting in the passenger seat, just calmly eating a bag of chips. <laughs> and he turns over and he looks at me and he says, "Hey, Dad, are you nervous?" No. <laughs> As I'm going like this, I couldn't see the road. No one was around us. It was dark. It was hard to stay on the path as we were doing that. And here in Acts, Barnabas challenges them to remain faithful, to continue with steadfast purpose. Some translations say with a resolute heart. Other translations say, with all your heart. Literally, it means with a purposed heart. It's it's where our will and our emotions intersect with our faith and our commitments. Where we say, well, I'm going to keep some commitments in my life that help me to keep Jesus in the center of it all. Where you say, hey, I'm not going to quit diving into the word of God, even though sometimes I don't feel like it. I'm not going to quit diving into worship on a regular basis, even though I got so much craziness going on around me in life. I'm I'm not going to quit diving into both friendships with those around me who need the Lord and friendships in my life who really encourage me in my walk with God. I'm I'm not going to quit diving into the grace of God. That reminds me every day that I am a new creation. Not because of what I have done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for me. And I get to be the hands and feet of Jesus because of his goodness and love. You know, it reminds me of a statistic that I heard from World War II once. It's a startling statistic. It goes like this. It has to do with the loss of life during World War II. In World War II, in France alone, 212,000 people lost their life in France. In Great Britain, 382,000 war deaths occurred. In the United States during World War II, there were 407,000 deaths, not including civilian deaths. And those numbers are staggering. But the number that really caught my attention was the loss of life in Germany. Because if you look at France and the United States during the Second World War, each country lost about a half to 1% of their population, which is just startling and heartbreaking. But in Germany, they lost seven and a half million people, not including the Holocaust numbers, which adds another six million people. Over, well over 10% of the population of Germany died, so much so that toward the end of the war, some of the Germans were really waking up to the evil that was going on, and they became critical of the direction their government was going. And so Britain got hold of wind of this, and so they changed their strategy. Instead of just dropping bombs in Germany, they started dropping messages. Little pamphlets of piece of paper that said things like this. You go into this war isolated from the commonwealth of civilized people, having the support of nobody. Remember that Britain never gives way. Our nerves are tougher and our sinews are stronger than yours. We will never give up. And these pamphlets are raining down as millions of people are dying around the Germans. And it was that allied resolve, along with the breaking of the will of the German people, that ultimately destroyed the German war machine and brought ultimate victory to the allies. And in the midst of our life, when we have things thrown at us, we just need to make sure that God's word and the hope of Christ is always falling around us in this life. And that we're soaking in that. And so God reminds us to press into Jesus. 
to press into his grace, to press into his power, to press into worship. And for some of us who are here, maybe for the very first time, maybe God is just nudging you that for you that pressing on simply means to come back and begin to learn how Jesus really can be the centerpiece of your life and how that changes everything uh, in this world around us. And so what faith step might any of us take today to keep Christ at the center of it all? Because an unshakable foundation is also found by keeping Christ at the center of our relationships. And we see this in verse 24 in the early church. It says, For Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. A great many people were added to the Lord. And so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so all these people are coming to Christ in Antioch. And Barnabas thinks, well, I need to go get Saul, but Saul's in Tarsus. And, it, you know, he, he says, I need some help to do what God's leading me to do. And there are all these people coming to faith because the church in Antioch is sharing the hope of Jesus with all their friends and with all their family. And Barnabas, he couldn't send a text to go get Saul in Tarsus. Uh, no texting back then. It's a hundred mile journey from where he is in Antioch to go to Tarsus to find Saul. And so 200 miles round trip, probably by foot. Uh, I have done a few backpack trips over 100 miles, one just under 300 miles. That's my humble boast for the day. Hope you're impressed out there anyway. <laughs> but I'll just say this, 100 miles on foot's a long way. It's a really long way. And Barnabas says, I need someone in my life who's going to help me to stay at the center of what God's leading me to do right now. And we read in verse 26, for a whole year after he went and got Saul, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. It's pretty cool. It all starts right there. And what that tells me is that quality relationships really matter. Helping us to keep Christ at the center, it really matters that we have some really strong friendships with people around us to help us to do that. And it causes me to ask, well, how far do we need to be willing to walk to keep Christ at the center of our life right now? How far is God asking you to go right now in your life? What faith steps is he asking you to take to keep him at the center of your life? Because it may not always be convenient, may not always be easy. It may even call for sacrifice, but I'll tell you, keeping Christ at the center is good. And he is worthy of it. And he's inviting us to do that with him. Or, or maybe today, it's not how far you need to be able to keep Christ in the center of your life. How far is God asking you to go to maybe help some other people keep him at the center of their life? Maybe it's to be a group leader for one of our summer groups this summer to just gather some people for some meals during the summer to build some friendships. You can talk to Pastor Danny about that if God's leading you in that. But maybe it's to take a faith step as a parent in your own walk with the Lord so that you can lead the way and model the way for your children. Or maybe right now in your life, you're feeling like Josh and I did in that car in that snowstorm. And you're just having trouble seeing the road you're supposed to be on right now. Because the storm is coming at you. And it's hard to see. And I remember being in that storm and being the driver and getting tighter and tighter on my steering wheel as the snow's hitting the windshield. And I just could not see the road. And I'm looking over at my relaxed son eating those potato chips thinking, save some for me. We're going to have to live on those tonight. <laughs> And I was starting to get worried inside. And I've been on snow roads so many times in my life. And honestly, I started to get that nervous flutter inside, trying to not show it on the outside as a dad. And then all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, this snowplow, this huge snowplow, burst through this, some side street through this huge berm of snow right on the main highway where we were. And when I say a huge snowplow, I mean one of those big tractor ones with the huge tractor tires and the chains on the tires and a big plow in front. And he had like, you know, big flashing lights on top and, and you know, and just high beams on everywhere. I mean, it was like a driving lighthouse. 
And he starts plowing the way on this road and we got behind that driver and we started following them up the mountain. And just as we crested the summit, he goes off on some side road and we sailed down to where we were staying that night. And this is all I know. Sometimes in life, when the storm's hitting us, we're having trouble staying on center lane with the Lord, God has this way of surprising us and popping out in front of us. And we know it's him. Amen. And all we have to choose to do is follow him as the light. Amen. Wherever he's leading in that moment. Press on, encounter family. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being the light. Thank you for being our lighthouse. Thank you that you are worthy of holding the center of our life, the foundation of our life, and thank you for being unshakable even when we get shook up. Lord, I pray that your hope would be known to all in this room today. I pray that they would hear your voice and hear your Holy Spirit here on this Pentecost Sunday that is celebrated by the church and the yearly calendar, Lord. We just celebrate the work of your Holy Spirit Lord, I just ask that you'll give us conviction to see the commitments that you want us to have, Lord, but also the grace that just lifts us up even though we don't deserve it and can't do anything about it. Lord, encourage your people today. We love you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray, amen.